the KMAX Sports Network. From Cedar Park, Texas, live, it's Timberwolf Night in America. An hour and a half, a non-stop honking of the Cedar Park football horn. Our seventh show of the season, our sixth season of the show, the 75th show overall since we started doing this in 2011. I am the alleged V of the T, the voice of the Timberwolves, Brad Cohn. We are live tonight from Majori's near the intersection of Cypress Creek Road and La Caline near Randall's. We'll be here until 9 o'clock if you want to come on down. Joining me, as has become customary here on Timberwolf Night in America, the king of laces out. There ain't no bolder holder than the donut hole. He's better than finger licking good at what he does. My own personal Chris Collinsworth, the Willard of Oz, lifetime Timberwolf Josh Willard. Hey, 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 don't lick my fingers right now because they'll <laughs> turn into icicles. But um, bum Oh, and we're out here on the porch. It's going to be a great night, but can't wait to talk about this Timberwolf football team. Hate that I missed last week's game, but glad we can dish it out right here. All right, this season, Josh is also handling technical production for this show, twirling all the plates on the sticks and keeping the whole thing from crashing down all around us. And the great Les Clary is our quality assurance agent again tonight, monitoring the broadcast in the high-tech, high-fashion K-Max studios, making sure that we don't sound like a B-29 during a belly landing. We're set up <laughs> outside. but um, um We're set up outside tonight, even though it's rain and cold. Yesterday, if you don't know, in the Austin area, the temperature went from 90 to 55 like it saw a state trooper. <laughs> Our special guests tonight, the defensive line with us tonight are Jacob Munoz, Ben Bell, Josiah Whittington, Sasquatch, Ben Blankenship, Joshua Slowy, B.J. Jones, and with them, coaches Jason James and Samuel Four. We'll be talking with all of them a little bit later in the show. And a very special extra guest tonight, a blast from our own past, a former member of this defensive line himself, former Florida State Seminole and lifetime Timberwolf, Holmes Onwakafi. Give it up, give it up! But before I get started tonight, I need to pause for a second. Everyone else in my family is at my middle daughter Allison's house at this moment. She's CPHS class of 03 for a birthday party for my middle granddaughter, Leah. Leah is seven years old today, and she's listening right now. So, Leah, happy birthday, and I hope you have a great time with everybody tonight. Love you, and I'll see you soon. All right, here's the schedule for tonight, a review of the Georgetown game. Blue Chipper Blues, our third or our fourth installment, looking at how some top players have done against Cedar Park through the years. Josh's segment, The Wonderful World of Willard. We'll check other scores of interest in 11-5A and around Central Texas. A conversation with the Cedar Park D-Line and Holmes Own Wakafi. And then a fun trivia game with the guys and a look ahead at this week's game with Hutto. Josh, Friday night. You missed it, but it was a tough opponent. One of the top teams in the district, the Georgetown Eagles, a team that Cedar Park historically in our own building has had a tough time with. We usually slaughter them on the road. Scores like 47 to 14 and 51 to 13 and 49 to 20 have occurred. But at the GUP, the last three scores have now been 31-28, 28-27, and last Friday night, 27-24. And for the first time this season, the team didn't really show clear and obvious improvement from the previous game, but a victory nonetheless, and an important one to put us on a five-game winning streak. And now, all alone in first place in the district race at 3-0 since Hutto has played one less game. Uh, Cedar Park still coming out with that win. You know that's exactly what they wanted. It doesn't matter how they got it as long as they came out with the victory and a district win at that, and especially against Georgetown because that's a very physical team. Uh, that's a good tight-knit community, and so they really get behind that Georgetown Eagle football team, and so they know – uh, you know that every single game is going to be physical. You know they'll be technically sound. And so for Cedar Park to still put it on them, and from talking with you over the weekend, it, the score doesn't really necessarily tell all the story. So it was a little bit closer than it should have been, but it's still the Cedar Park Timberwolves getting the victory and extending that district um, record to undefeated and uh, going into a really big game against the Hutto Hippos. And before we get into the in-depth review of the action against Georgetown, let's pause for a moment to look at the state of the program. It was a milestone win of sorts, as Cedar Park football's all-time record is now 175 wins against just 66 losses. In 241 games, Josh, we have a program winning percentage of 726. That's better than winning three out of every four games over a span of 19 years now. This season, for the first time, the program itself is older than any of its players. The all-time record in district games is 93-30 and 30 with a current 29-game district winning streak that reaches all the way back to 2014. The all-time record at the gut, 47-4. and four. 
Cedar Park is now 11-2 and against Georgetown all time. We've been to three state championship games in the last seven years and won two of those. Carl Absek's career head coaching record now 44-5. and five. So why are these sports commentators saying, you know, the Patriots and the Spurs have this organization? Let's put Cedar Park on the map. I mean, come on. Now, that's some winning right there. And why doing not? it traditionally over a, two decades? Come on. That's a lot of winning right there. Uh, yeah. I bet the Patriots haven't won three out of every four for the last 19 years. And their quarterback is an Uggs model. Yeah, we don't get to have our quarterback come back every year, every year, every year, every year. We've got to build a new one all what? the time. I'll take a shot at him. Okay, I will too. <laughs> all right, a review of the Georgetown game here. Cedar Park started and ended this game well. In the middle, not so well. We got to the unmentionable stunt fairly early in the second quarter, but still only managed that three-point win. In the first third of the game, we outgained the Eagles 176 to 72 on the way to a 17 to 3 lead. In the final third of the game, we outgained them 147 to 54 and outscored them 10 to 7. Their final score coming with just a couple of minutes left in the game. The totals of a 323 to 126 yardage margin and a 27 to 10 scoring margin in those first and last thirds of the game felt like the kind of contest we expected. But that bad middle made it a closer thing. In that middle third, we were outgained 180 to minus three Ooh. and outscored 14 to nothing. Ooh. Now, started off well enough with two strong scoring drives in our first two possessions, sandwiched around Georgetown, losing the ball on downs. The first drive covered 51 yards in 10 plays, ending in a 32-yard field goal by Justin Bohr and a 3-0 lead four minutes and 15 seconds into the game. After the Eagles failed on fourth down at hour 40, Ryder in the storm galloped 60 yards in eight plays to score a one-yard run by Jonathan Stockwell to go up 10-0 with 4.20 left in the first. There's an exchange of three and outs that got us into the second quarter, and then Georgetown found some answers on offense. They would score on each of their next three possessions. This first one started from their own 37, went 48 yards in 14 plays before being stopped by the black rain at R15. Their man came on and knocked through their own 32-yard. It was 10-3 with 4.43 left before halftime. Didn't take long for the Timberwolves to answer. After a six-yard gain on first down, Hernandez flung it downfield to Brandon Breed, who hauled it in for a 56-yard oh, yeah. touchdown pass. Boer's kick made it 17-3 in the unmentionable stat was reached with 3.35 left before halftime. That's when the wheels fell off, for a while at least, for Cedar Park, counting their one-play possession before halftime that was just taking a knee. Over their next four possessions, they'd lose three yards, ending in first that knee, then a punt, then over on downs, and an interception, running only 10 plays. Meanwhile, Georgetown was like the German Army in France in 1940. They rumbled 180 yards on 23 plays and, and scored a couple of touchdowns. Those came almost on top of each other in terms of the game clock, but about 40 minutes apart on the wall clock. They ended the first half with a 12-play 80-yard march that ended in a five-yard pass to Noah Drum from Jackson's, Jackson Siosin with 10 seconds left in the half. Kick made it 17-10 to 10 at intermission. They'd won the toss and deferred, so immediately in game clock terms, they got the ball back. After a two-yard plunge into the line, Siosin managed the most unlikely touchdown run in Cedar Park opponent's history. Somehow escaping three guys in a sack eight yards in the backfield on second down, Siosin then slowly rambled downfield, zigging and zagging and bouncing off of what seemed like 112 guys for a 67-yard touchdown, Mosey. The kick tied the game at 17, just seconds into the third quarter. Cedar Park then had their second three and out of the game, punting it away. But on the second Georgetown play, a pick by Sam Muir seemed to set things up for the offense, but they could only manage seven yards and turn it over on downs to the Georgetown 23. No matter. On the third play of the next Eagle possession, another pick by the Black Rain, this one by Tamar Alzer. CP started at the Georgetown 45, at this time lost 16 yards Ooh. in three plays before throwing their own interception that was run all the way back to the Cedar Park 25. Suddenly the Timberwolves, at one point leading by the unmentionable margin at 17-3, were in serious trouble and 25 yards away from falling behind near the end of the third quarter. That's when the game changed again. Cedar Park gathered up the wheels and put them back on. That's one of the many differences between this program and so many others. The Black Rain rose up and swatted the Eagle offense, holding them to just five yards and four plays, and the ball went over on downs of the 20. There followed a meticulous, clock-eating, eight-play, 73-yard drive that unfortunately stalled at the seven, with Bohr coming on and punching through a 24-yard field goal, giving Cedar Park back the lead at 2017 with 11.54 left in the game. The Black Rain went right back to work, throwing Georgetown backward nine yards and three plays and forcing another punt. 
The offense started in great field position at the 42 and covered that in 10 plays with Hernandez hitting Carson Neal standing all alone in the back of the end zone for the touchdown. Kick made it 27-17 with just 5.52 left. But Georgetown, like the Germans at the Battle of the Bulge, had one last offensive in them. They went 63 yards in eight plays with the score coming on a 19-yard pass from Siosin to Dylan Cahill with just 3.52 left in the game. Offense came out and sucked the blood right out of the clock, going 32 yards in five deliberate plays to the Georgetown 22 before taking knees to end the game. If they'd meet another score, they would have easily gotten one. Here are stats from this game. We actually got out first downs. It doesn't happen often in a win, 18 to 17. We got outrushed, 122 yards to 137. They averaged 5.07 on the ground. We just three and a half yards a carry. 12 of 19 through the air for Hernandez, one pick. A couple of touchdowns, 218 yards, 11.47 yards per attempt. Their guy, 18 of 26 with two picks, 162 yards, only 6.23 yards per attempt. That was one of the big differences. Total offense, Cedar Park 340, Georgetown 299. Hernandez had all the passing yards, 12 of 19, one pick, two scores, 218 yards. We're looking at the rushing, Stockwell leading rusher, 16 for 56 and a touch. Daniel Hernandez, two carries for 11. Ryder, seven for 22. Majestin Havre, eight for 21. Javion Mays, two for 10. Interesting and good to see Javion Mays getting in on the running game. Receiving wise, Will Adoye had three catches for 61 yards. Carson Neal, five for 47 and a touch. Logan Mayu won for nine, and a critical one that basically ended the game. We needed a first down on a fourth down, and he got it, and then we were able to take knees. Brandon Breed struck again, three catches, 101 yards, and a couple of scores. Thoughts, Josh? Uh, that seems like a great performance, and especially when you're looking at the stats on, on paper. Brandon Breed, three catches, 101 yards, two scores. It's just exciting to see him coming back from the injury those first couple games, missing and then getting back into the lineup, being so versatile and stretching this. De the opposing defense is so deep. He's a, a, such a threat. And then Carson Neal always coming underneath and just picking up anything that he can get. Um, just very Julian Edelman-esque in the way Carson Neal plays his game. Uh, but just happy about the Timberwolves, too, for – bogging down and then finding a way to coming back out of it. That's going to be key, especially when they're going to try to make a deep playoff run. Uh, things aren't going to go your way. You might go backwards on offense and defense. You might let them go by you a couple times and get burned. Uh, but it's how you pick it up and how you can react. And uh, the Timberwolves definitely found a way to get it done. 27-24 score isn't a, it isn't a, you know, a big one, um, a big difference. But at the end of the day, it's a win, and it's a district win, and that's an important one. So... Um, just overall excited about the performance from the Timberwolves. It wasn't there. I mean, how are penalties? I mean, was penalties an issue? Did that? Penalties were an issue. Uh, they were. only had six. We had about 12 for over 100 yards. And we'd kind of been solving that lately. Penalties going down and down and down, both in number and yards. But they were back up in this game. And so then once again, you come out with a victory and more things to work on for a program that has a winning percentage of over 3-4. So, you know, it's just just keep piling it on. Well, and we said on the broadcast and the postgame show that you know, if, if you're not a good team and you had the problems and issues we had in this game against a, a strong team like Georgetown, you don't win. You lose. Right. It takes a good team to kind of play subpar and still beat a good team. Right. You know, so, I mean, it's, it's still a good sign. All right, here are some bits of tid. Uh, oh, and the other thing is Craig Weems here has a theory. His Ooh. theory is that uh, Carl Absack kept everything close to the vest and oh. vanilla of the offense because he knew all the huddle players of the bye were in the stands watching the game, and he wanted them to think that, ah, 27-24, we got this. And it wouldn't work as hard as if we 56 to 3 the guys. A former professor of economics at Cedar Park <laughs> has the theories. I don't doubt it. That's, and that's a good, good one right there. You're on to something there, Sherlock. All right, here are some bits of tid. This game was only close because of the two touchdowns and three plays for Georgetown that came at the end of the first half, and then the second play of the second half. 67 seconds on the game clock separated them. I checked it, and those are the fastest consecutive scores ever on a Cedar Park team by an opponent. Without those, this game is a routine 27-10 ho-hummer. Nearly half of their first downs tonight came on those two possessions, and one yard less than half their total yards on the night came on those half-ending and half-beginning possessions, in between which Cedar Park ran one play, and that was just to take a knee to end the first half. Wow. Also, this was the first game since I've been tracking this stat over the last six years where both teams scored every time they penetrated the red zone. That's good to hear just about our offense. They're getting into the red zone, and they're making things happen and finishing up with points. That's good to hear. Another rushing touchdown from close in in this game. Ooh. That's, that's good stuff. 
Stockwell, a one-yarder. All right, something I do every week for Coach Absec after I update the record book. Here are my observations I sent him from updating the stats in the school record book. So stop me wherever you want to talk about any of these. With 240 yards of total offense, Ryder Hernandez passes Drew Russo, Chris Hutchings, Bill Esteveno, Hayden Craig, Thomas Middleton, and Ryan Fiala to jump from 20th to 14th on the list of career total offense in Cedar Park oh in my, one game. Oh, my goodness. With his 47 yards receiving, Carson Neal passes Ryan Fiala for 15th on the career total offense list. Wow. A and he's a receiver. Yeah. Highest receiver on that list, by the way. Uh, this team now has the current numbers 14, 15, and 16 on that list, all within 86 yards of each other, the receiving career yardage list. Uh, with two more touchdown passes against Georgetown, Ryder Hernandez climbs to number six on the list of career touchdown passes with 17. Number five is Ryan Fiala with 19. Ooh. And Ryder's a sophomore who started, what, five games? Six games now? Five games? Um, rewriting the history books. Ryder's 218 passing yards jumps him from eighth to fifth on the list of most passing yards in a season with only seven games played. Nate Grimm and Max Sexton, with two complete seasons each at the end of long playoff runs, are the only players ahead of him. Yeah. Uh, now with 1,699 career passing yards, Ryder passes Ryan Fiala, 16-10, and Amir Alzer, 16-26, for oh. seventh on that list. Such a good name in Cedar Park, Amir Alzer. Yo. Every player above Ryder now has played at least two complete seasons, and three of them have played three. And he's those are the only people ahead of him. Uh, the 56-yard touchdown pass from Hernandez to Brandon Breed is tied for the 20th longest in Cedar Park history, and there are hundreds and hundreds of passes complete, maybe maybe thousands of passes complete. Who knows? Yeah, this, just this season. <laughs> the, ga the game has changed, Holm, changed Holmes, and Cedar Park is different. They, they don't run it, run it, run it, run it, run it. Oh, we wouldn't mind if they did some running. I, I, would, I, I would like 300 yards passing, 200 yards rushing every game. That really gets me going. Uh, uh, yeah. All right, now the 49-yard uh, completion from Hernandez to Willadoye ties for the 26th longest in Cedar Park history. Georgetown was Ryder's seventh consecutive 100-yard-plus passing performance in Cedar Park football Ooh. history. Only Max Sexton's string of 12, spanning 2015 and 2016 games, is longer. In a season, though, is that, the, is that tied as the season? For within a season? Eh, I didn't I look at it that tied. way. Just the string, whether it spans seasons I think I not. memorized his record book. Maybe it is tied. Cool. All right. All right, Brandon Breed climbs to 12th on the list of most career receptions with 42 now. With 866 career receiving yards, Breed passes Dylan Cox, Drew McDaniel, and Patrick oh. Anthony to reach ninth on the career list. If he gets the 112 he's been averaging this year in the next game, he'll jump from ninth to sixth oh on this goodness. list. So much football left. Carson Neal is now just 357 yards short of Tommy Levine's record for most receiving yards in a season, set in 16 games in 2015. Neal's played less than half that many here in 2018. Oh, my goodness. Breed's yardage from this game jumped him. Uh, on the same list from 23rd to 11th. Whoa, what a jump. <laughs> Here, listen to these names. He passed single season totals by Jamie Knight, Peyton Sawicki, Chris Shedler, Trevor Mugato, Jack Grimm, Sam Brock, Patrick Anthony, himself last year, Carlos Woolery, Hayden Craig, Diedrich McKnight, and Michael Darby. Oh. This is perhaps the largest one game jump Best in our line. record book that I've ever seen. That's unbelievable. That's a, oh, so many names right there. Yeah, Cedar Park Royalty I just read off. Six of the 39 100-yard-plus receiving games this program's ever had have occurred this season. Wow. Uh, the team's now just 12 yards shy of reaching 2,000 passing yards in the season, on schedule to get there earlier than any other Cedar Park team ever has. It is so fun to watch them spread it out and just go down the really field. Oh. The 67-yard touchdown run by Jackson. Yeah, some of these records are not good. Oh. This one. The 67-yard touchdown run by Jackson Siosin of Georgetown was the longest run allowed this year and the 12th longest run ever allowed by any Cedar Park defense. Mm. Oh, a quarterback. Dang. A quarterback? Dang. A quarterback? A lanky one, too. Uh, here's another bad one. The lowest average rushing yards per game in a full season by any Cedar Park team was 146 for the 2002 team that went 3-7. and seven. And they ran the wing tee. Uh, yeah. To date this season, we're averaging 105.5. <laughs> oh. 
were unfortunately well on schedule to be the worst rushing team ever. That's okay. But the passing Make yards passing. are on schedule to be the best passing. passing team ever. It doesn't matter how you get points on the board. Now, here are a couple of scoreboard trends I monitor over the years. It, we call this thing the 20 line. The program is now 124 and 8 all time when scoring more than 20 points a game. Wow. When you see that 20 get up there, we're 124 and 8. Uh, second half leads. The program is now 119 and 7 when leading at halftime since I started tracking this when uh, Chris Ross came, 2005. Y'all don't listen to these. <laughs> you, don't, you don't look at that scoreboard and you don't remember Brad Cohn's stat. No, you don't remember that, but that's awesome. All right, we're going to take a short break. When we return, our third installment of Blue Chipper Blues back in a flash with more of this kind of stuff. Timberwolf Night in America. Head to Majori's for food, drinks, and fun. They have specials almost every night, from $4 burgers to a dollar off on pastas to $7 Mexican night. And on Mondays, kids eat free. Bring the whole crew and have a great time at Majori's. They're a favorite hangout of a lot of Cedar Park football people, from fans to booster club folks to players to coaches. Great appetizers, pasta dishes, seafood, fresh green salads, burgers, pizza, sandwiches, buffalo wings, baby back ribs, stromboli, and more. Food, drinks, and fun at Majori's. Check them out at magstexas.com. Experience the difference at Toyota of Cedar Park, one of the Austin area's newest automobile dealerships. Their new vehicle department will always stock the newest Toyota models you need. The pre-owned vehicles they choose must each pass a rigorous inspection and be in tip-top shape before they make it to their lot or website for you to see. And if you're looking for budget-friendly Toyota certified used vehicles, they've got you covered. And you can rest easy knowing that the best new cars make the best used cars. That's Toyota of Cedar Park at Toyota of Cedar Park. Park.com. Jeff Dietz Allstate offices are at 401 East Whitestone. That's on 1431 across the street from the Cedar Park Post Office. And he can get you into the right insurance coverage, ranging over many of the most important aspects of your life. Auto, home, condo, motorcycle, ATV, boat, plus life insurance and business insurance. Call Allstate agent Jeff Dietz at 512-528-0099. You're in good hands with Jeff Dietz and Allstate. Army Ant Moving calls Cedar Park home. For movers that residents and businesses can rely on, for outstanding moving expertise and trustworthy estimates, Army Ant Moving stands above the rest. Their reputation speaks for itself. They've received the Angie's List Superior Service Award for the last two years. Their movers are highly trained and experienced. So whether you need to move your household to a new home across town or an entire corporate office to a new location, your valuables are in knowledgeable and reliable hands with Army Ant Moving Company. Check them out at armyantmoving.com. This is the KMAX Sports Network. <laughs> All right, welcome back to Timberwolf Night in America, live from the 613 in Majorys. Plenty of time left for you to come on down and sit with us, Josh and Brad, and some Cedar Park Timberwolves, present and past. We just recapped the Georgetown game from last Friday night at the GUP. Timberwolves now on a modest five-game winning streak and a school record 29-game district winning streak. A trivia question for you, Josh. Prior to this current 29-game district winning streak, what was the program's previous longest such streak? It has to be from my season, 2010. We went undefeated. Just not, I mean, not to brag. I mean, just not to brag. Not to brag. We went undefeated in the regular No brag, season. just fact. Um, but then they lost again to Lake Travis that next year. So that would have only been a, what, was that six teams in that district? I don't remember. So it would have been 11 game? Close. It was 12, and we did it twice. Oh. The, the, the streak where you're mentioning, where it ended with a, a Lake Travis loss in the district title game at the end of 11. Yeah. That's the last time we've lost a district home game, uh, seven years ago. Uh, and we also did it uh, in 12 games uh, spanning the 2012 and 13 seasons oh, okay. in district. So, yeah, we did it 12 twice. So more than doubled. The next best district winning streak we've ever had currently with this 29-game streak that stretches back to 2014, uh, 18, what is that, five seasons ago? That's unbelievable. Four years, five seasons. All right, we've got a programming note for you. Next week, the team has a bye. This show will follow suit. No, Timberwolf Night in America next week will resume in two weeks. 
across the street over there. Mutons, a Tuesday night prior to the Paflugerville game, since that's a home game. All right, now it is time for Blue Chipper Blues. Our segment that samples what so many stud recruits have done when they face Cedar Park. And we've seen a lot of the very best. The synopsis we present here on Blue Chipper Blues include descriptions of the efforts of players who were, at the time we played them, among the top national recruits at whiteout and running back and quarterback. Not that we don't think that all the numbers these players run up against their other opponents, all the press accolades, all the recruiter attention, all the amazing highlight footage is unjustified or untrue or anything like that. It's just that most of the time when we see such players go up against our Timberwolves, we don't really see very much. We started off this feature three weeks ago by looking at the entirely pedestrian numbers put up against Cedar Park in two games during the 2011 season by current Cleveland Browns quarterback and Heisman Trophy winner Baker Mayfield. <laughs> Last week we looked at the completely forgettable 3.1 yards per carry average in two games against Cedar Park by eventual Heisman Trophy candidate and all Big 12 running back from Temple Lake Seastrunk. Oh. Holmes had a <laughs> shot of that, yeah. Last week, we took a look at the miserable performance by the nation's top wideout recruit opting out of one game against Cedar Park to avoid getting hit in 2010. We Heard footsteps. From a teammate. And catching four meager passes for minimal yardage and losing a fumble in a 49 to nothing route at the GUP in 2011. Austin High's eventual Texas and Arizona player, currently with the Minnesota Vikings, if you can believe it, Caleb Jones. Tonight, we'll look at a guy who's Actually, the son of one of our favorite analysts on the broadcast team from back in the 2009 season. Holmes was here then. This player was once listed as one of the top 50 high school quarterbacks in the country by ESPN. He eventually went on to play quarterback at Montana State and then for the Oregon Ducks, an elite D1 team. But his high school numbers in two games against Cedar Park are so trivial as to be, well, trivial. We are talking right about Vandergrift Vipers quarterback Dakota Prukop. Dakota's the son of our good friend Tim Prukop, who joined Jim Byerly and me for a great broadcast run in our final season in 6A ball, the district title run of 2009, the one year that New Bible was our home field. Tim was an outstanding collegiate quarterback himself who once led Cal Poly to the NCAA D2 National Championship game. Uh, Dakota played his freshman year of high school football in our own program at Cedar Park that year in 2009. And if Vandergriff High School hadn't been built, he would have eventually competed with Brian Hogan and Nate Grimm to quarterback our 2010, 11, and 12 teams. So as it turned out, the opening of Vandergriff was a good thing for Dakota because he probably would not have been able to beat out either of those guys for the job. And his eventual nice collegiate future would never have occurred. Dakota rang up good numbers his three varsity seasons as the starter with Vandy, leading to all those accolades and offers, except when he played Cedar Park. In two games against the Timberwolves, he was injured and missed the game his junior season, Prukop did little. He went into the last Vandy drive of the 2012 game his senior year, just 9 of 26 that night with an interception and only 61 passing yards, and he rushed that night for a total of just 9 yards on 13 carries. He did complete three of his last five throws, one of those a 48-yard touchdown strike. In the 2010 game against the Timberwolves, Prukop completed one pass out of nine for one whole yard and ran eight times for just seven yards. So in two games against Cedar Park's defense, Prukop's total numbers against the Black Rain were 13 for 40 with two interceptions for 138 yards and one touchdown. That's 3.45 yards per attempt and 16 rushing yards on 23 carries, 0.69 yards per carry. Oh, and he suffered seven sacks as well. So in 61 touches over those two games, runs and passes, 37 of them went for zero or negative yardage, and 44 of the 61 went for two yards or less. Brukop would eventually play for three years at Montana State and set some records there, then one year over at Oregon, and is now in the CFL with the Toronto Argonauts, winning a Grey Cup with them uh, summer before last in 2017. Undoubtedly a fine high school quarterback and all his other performances, Prukop accomplished little to nothing in his two games against Cedar Park. With all due respect to Tim, before I use this line, it was the black rain that was Dakota's daddy. I mean, and he was an unbelievable talent. And I got to go to a UTSA uh, camp down at their campus with Larry Coker. And 
I, I got to go up to do my slot route, and I looked over, and Dakota was my quarterback. So hey. I, I kind of was like, all right, I mean, that's good. I have somebody can throw it to me. But then, like any other time we were in the booth and watching them, Cedar Park's black rain, the way that they pressure a quarterback and the way that they put a quarterback off of their spot, it, it's just tremendous. And you can sit back, and you can look at these players go on and have great careers, and you can just smile and know that, I mean, my boys did work on them. So, you know, yep. it yep. is what it is. It is what it is. All right, next week our subject on Blue Chipper Blues will be Westlake and later Wake Forest quarterback Tanner Price. Holmes Omakoffee hit him a few times in 2009. And, uh, yeah, he didn't do much against Cedar Park either. Mm. All right, now we're off to see the Willard, the wonderful Willard of Oz. It's time for Josh's segment, The Wonderful World of Willard. Man, we're going to keep it light tonight. I just want to say sorry to you guys for missing your game last week. I had to go attend a wedding of my... He was a brother. He was a trench dog. I mean, he was an offensive lineman. I know y'all don't like O-linemen, but Shane Britton, class of 11, got married. He actually did it. We didn't think he could. Sugar Shane. But sh Sugar Shane Britton, I was a holder. He was my snapper. So, I mean, we had – that's who, Kim. Who would say yes to that guy? Yeah. Hey, he's a cowboy now. He's pretty – he's done well. So, I, I apologize to you guys, but excited to hear that y'all got the win. Super proud of y'all. I'm uh, ready for y'all to get after it this week. This is one that's going to be crazy. We're going to get into that. Um, but just kind of – I don't want to look past this game because this is going to yeah. be a, such a fun game, and we're going to see so much uh, out on the field on Friday night. But if you're going to be out at the Circuit of the Americas this weekend, Formula One, want to go see the Krispy Kreme food trailer, come holla at your boy, turn 12. What's up? Oh, yeah, there you go. Yeah, so if you want some, donut, if you want some donuts, if you need to pick me up, just come find me. I, I can hook it up. But um, yeah, I actually know you're going to have to wear the donut suit and have to walk around <laughs> for a little bit, but – that's okay. Well, you're, you're offering uh, a pretty fair money for anybody who wants to work that day for you, right? Oh, that's right. No, if, if Tell anybody, them about that. Maybe oh, you yeah, get some workers look, If anybody's looking to make a quick buck, just holler at me. You know, I got, I got, I got room to sell some donuts, so it's going to be busy. But um, just excited for a busy week, excited for this game. NBA season tips off tonight. I know we got baseball on right here, Boston and Houston. Boston is kind of giving Houston the business yeah. right now. 8-2 Boston so, right now. So that's okay. That's okay. But, man, I – just solely focused on this Timberwolf team because now we're going into the latter part of the district season, especially with this game against Hutto. A lot riding on this game. Um, I don't know. I'm ready to dish it out and get into it with these boys. We're, we're getting into the meat of the schedule now. All right, now it's time to bring in our very special guest tonight. As I've said these last two weeks, this is a guy who's on the Brad Cone all-time Timberwolf team on the D-line. My picks for our Hall of Fame defensive line right now are Tim Nicky. Jeff Peden, and this young man, Holmes Unwakafi. Holmes earned a football scholarship at Florida State under Jimbo Fisher. Got a lot of playing time at linebacker on special teams, but his career ended early by an injury. Stayed in school and graduated. He's now back home in the Austin area. Very busy. There's a lot going on, and right now we'll hear all about his life's journey so far. Here is Holmes Unwakafi. There we go. Hey. Hey, how's it going, guys? Uh, thank you. Again, thank you, Brad and Josh, for having me out tonight. Um, uh, good to be back and, um, you know, around, around a lot of Timberwolves. And uh, just, yeah, happy to, you know, look forward to see what uh, Cedar Park does with Hutto this weekend. But uh, Holmes, you're one of our all-time sack leaders. And I mentioned a minute ago, you got a couple good licks on Tanner Price, the Westlake quarterback. He ended up being, they said, one of the best quarterbacks in the ACC at Wake Forest while he was there. Uh, tell us about that. That was kind of fun, probably. Uh, so as far as uh, no, some of these these quarterbacks and to speak specifically, Tanner Price. I mean, he was a he was a left-handed left-handed quarterback. Oh, if right. I, yeah, if I remember correctly, right. and I forget what side I play, left or left or right side uh, defensive end. But uh, no, I mean, you got to look at, in college in the next level. You guys, it's getting to the quarterback that's the uh, that's the issue. So some of these offensive linemen are. Six six, three hundred pounds, and can move just as fast as a linebacker. So, you know, I'm sure Tanner had his had uh, had his time there, and um, you know, had some good you know a good performance. But uh, it was it was fun. It was fun competing against that team. And <laughs> they, oh no, the chats weren't nothing that year. Yeah. <laughs> they just yeah. went to the state championship game. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Now Holmes uh, on on the D line uh, for Cedar Park. Of course, your job is like you said, go get that quarterback. Right. Um, what is the best technique you can tell these guys about to help them be better high school defensive linemen to get to them? How did you get to guys off? You're one of our all-time sack leaders. So, um, you know, I think 
as a defensive end or as a defensive lineman, some of the the best attributes that that make up a defensive line is you know is that preparation, right? So throughout the week, you know, starting from Monday or Tuesday, you guys get your your scouting report. You guys have your film. It's taking time to watch the film, study the line, study the offensive lineman. Um, you know, you can you can tell. You know, hey, this offensive lineman gets. You know, after a couple a couple uh, a couple go arounds, this this guy gets frustrated. This offensive lineman is leaning on his heels, or you know, or he's a you know he takes that quick that quick run step block, right? So being able to being able to study your opponent, and then also in the in the mix in the midst of a game, being able to make those mid game adjustments. Um, you know, really being able to look, time the snap, and then as far as technique wise, you know, you you want to mix it up. You know, for that offensive lineman, whether it's, you know, your um, club ripping or your, you know, you spin or you put pressure on the offensive lineman for one round. But, um, you know, s some of those things. And I think a lot of success for, you know, for our team and for defensive line specifically comes uh, with the preparation in the in the film room. Yeah, no doubt about that. You know, you you came you played in in. Eight and nine on varsity, right? Right, correct. Chris Ross came and, and kind of built this program starting in 2005. And in five, six, and seven, he kind of installed the football, not just an offense or defense. He installed a football program, started building talent. And you were the result of some of that in eight and nine. Mm -hmm. Eight and nine was the first couple of years that Texas Football Magazine started talking about us and naming our players. And you were one of them. Right. But they talk about not just in the back where they named some of the – you know, you were mentioned in articles in the in the front, and some of our other guys were too. Uh, and it, it's a shame that we didn't yet start cruising through the playoffs right. until right after, after you we left. left. Right. But I you know. were there when a lot of guys uh, who really played at the next level at Texas, at Baylor, oh, were yeah. here. We had, uh, uh, describe for us some of your, your best moments playing right. football at Cedar Park. So in that time frame, it's interesting that you say that. So in that time frame, we you know, we had – you know, uh, teammates Dominic Espinoza, uh, Spencer Durango, Matt Wofford, uh, Chet Moss, Joey Nickel. Um, All went on to D1 football. Right. So what, what, I, what I'm going to say about that is I had my – we all had our work cut out for us during the week in practice every day. Those one-on-one -on -one matchups, whether it's offense or defense or working alongside with one of your teammates, I mean, you were going to get the best effort – right there in practice and if you didn't it would show uh it would show but then you know to compliment to compliment ourselves or to compliment that you know if you, if you worked hard and busted your butt during practice i mean it would show during a game i mean you uh, uh, the game would be would be easy because you worked so hard uh during the practice weekend so you know i give i give credit to uh you know the coaching staff and all of our all of our teammates and players i mean it really it takes everyone um you know, football is not, you know, an individual sport. It takes yeah. a team to uh, to get things done. And so uh, a lot of a lot of those things in the building blocks went in through practice through the through the practice week. I feel like we went through a transition period too, Holmes. You're the graduating class just ahead of me. And so we went through the defensive era with Coach Mann. And those were the early years for us in Cedar Park. And then we had Coach Willis come in. He completely brought a different scheme into our into our program. How did that affect your position? What were you a hand? Were you completely hands down with Coach Mann, or were oh, you I was uh, completely, completely hands down. I I did not get uh, you know the three four outside linebacker look. I think my last my last year in high That's school, right, 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 right last right. year in high school. But um, for the most part, I think Coach Willis brought in the um, you know that black rain defense, that mentality, and. And oh, um, you know, also Coach uh, Michael Quintero. Yeah. Uh, we Ooh. also had the, uh, you know, the stick, right, Rich? The stick with the, <laughs> yeah, the black, the get off ball, right, on the D line. So, uh, you know, that black rain mentality. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it, we hold it, we hold it proud here at Cedar Park, and you just want to make sure that that mentality, you know, carries on. You know, that black. When we say black rain defense, it's you know defense that wins championships, and you know sometimes the defense. You guys have to carry the team when um, you know when things aren't going so well. Yeah, both of our state championship wins in 12 and 15 were predominantly low-scoring games. That the defense really carry the day. You're right. Mm -hmm. You know, um, we uh, you had a, a big turning point in your life. 
uh, your last year at Cedar Park. You had, had suffered an injury at some point in your <laughs> underclass career, and, and your dad did not want you to play football your <laughs> senior year. And we were all thinking, oh, oh man. We, first of all, selfishly, <laughs> yeah. we would like him yeah, back. Absolutely. And I know he wants to play. Absolutely. And, and somehow you showed up. You played a great senior year. Yeah. What was that moment? How did you convince dad? Say, dad, I want to play. Yeah, so, you know, before I you know, I'll go into that, um, I just want to, you know, I think – a little bit like culture, uh, you know, when you look back in Nigeria and the culture, culture wise, you know, the sport that they hold true is, is pre predominantly soccer. Yeah. Um, so football and playing, playing football and, and hitting one another in that, you know, aggressive sort of sport was something that, you know, was un unfamiliar, unfamiliar to my parents. And so, you know, when that injury happened, you know, it was a, it was a big shock to the family, even to myself, I wasn't sure, you know, I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to play football again, you know, after that injury. But, um, you know, with the, you know, you know, God's grace and, um, you know, rehab and, you know, just going through that with, you know, Coach Bowman and, you know, also, you know, give credit to, uh, I want to give a shout out to Yancey Culp. Yeah. He helped through, uh, through that rehab process. Um, you know, I was, the, the injury healed in two months and, uh, I was able to get back out on the uh, on the field the next year, but uh, yeah, as far as convincing my parents, it was it was really showing them, you know, what uh, that I could do that that I could you know recover and make a a full contributing recovery back to the sport, and uh, it it took a while. You better <laughs> it, took, bet. it took a lot of in house conversation, I but uh, I'm 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 ha looking back hindsight, I'm so glad that I was able to uh, you know get out there and join my teammates again for my last year. And then you got noticed and got uh, picked up a ride at a pretty good school, Florida State, a pretty good coach, Jimbo Fisher. You know, we got a lot of Aggie fans that are Cedar Park fans. And tell our Aggie fans in Cedar Park a little bit about Jimbo Fisher. All right. So I know for all you Aggie fans out there, I know we live in we live in Texas here. So if it's not if it's not uh, if it's not UT, it's uh, it's A and M. But um, we are as far as Jimbo Fisher. We're sad to see him go. But I mean, you guys. You guys got a great coach, and I hope uh, this season's shown testament to that. Um, you know, over at the, uh, you know, when I was at Florida State, you know, I think some of the, the touch points I want to say about Jimbo Fisher was, you know, he told us it takes three years to build that, you know, that national championship program. And we were that last, that last recruiting class that he brought in, that 2010 recruiting class. And when I, in looking back, I mean, we had, we had talent and depth at every position. So, you know, number one, I want to give, you know, you guys, you know, just hope that, I mean, Jimbo Fisher has, has his blocks in order as far as, you know, his recruiting assistants uh, and their recruiting efforts. I mean, we're in the hotbed of, we're in the hotbed of recruiting in Texas. You know, you, it, it, realistically, uh, you don't have to leave the state of Texas to, you know, to pick up recruits, especially for these big D1 schools here in Texas. So just, you know, rest assured and be confident that, you know, the recruiting effort, the same way. I think you hear a lot of, sometimes you hear a lot of people, you know, complaining about, uh, you know, Alabama and what their, you know, their legacy. But leg Alabama has a, a system in place. You know, they are recruiting for four, three years down the line, you know, right now. That's why in the midst of a season, you see someone get hurt and then another four or five star is in there that you've never heard about. So it's those building blocks that those coaches are, are you know, are, are, you know, are keen to. And Jimbo Fisher came from, you know, Nick Saban era when they were both at LSU together. Yeah. So you'll see a commonality of that kind of, that mindset that Jimbo, Jimbo does a tremendous job of, you know, gathering player buy-in from all you know from everyone so he he just you know made it you know transferred over you know took this job with A&M but you know for him to have the the players buy into the program buy into the message you know really speaks to his uh to his effort as a coach he's uh he's gonna get the most out of you and uh, he's gonna work you but it'll pay off and and you'll look back and you'll be thankful that you did when uh when the game plays easy on Saturday I mean, practice, practice is practice. I think sometimes people see things on TV, and they uh, they get a little bit, a uh, little, a little wild that uh, a coach would be so irate. But I mean, 
practice is practice, and it practice is a whole nother level. Um, I think if you if you're gonna play football at the next level, um, it, it takes you you have to be you have to be willing to take some coaching, and you know it's gonna be some tough moments, but you're gonna have to pick up the slack and and uh, and corral yourself and you know play for the man next to you. But uh, it was a, it was a great time. It was a great coaching staff. Um, and then from the message that the things that they teach you as a young adolescent, 17, 18, 19 years old, and for my case, I was 15 hours away from home. Yeah. You know. So some of those some of those things that helps you become you know become a man and you know uh, responsible you know those you know being responsible and you know things that things that'll help you carry on in life uh, today. Now, am I remembering this right? Uh, when you got your injury, that meant you couldn't play football anymore. Mm -hmm. Didn't Fisher extend the scholarship anyway to let you finish school? Yep, and uh, yep. So and what was your what were you studying? Where'd you get your degree? In? Uh, so I got my uh, degree in uh, economics. Credit to uh, Mr. Weems over there. I took uh, so the interest in economics. I took one class in high school, and uh, I think it just really it must really, have stayed with you. Yeah, it just stayed with me. And then uh, I see economics as a I use it in my everyday life. And so, uh, yeah, it's really, it's really open doors, so uh, I thank you for that. <laughs> and so you've come back to the Austin area now, and, and you've in business and got other irons in the fire. Describe to folks what you're doing right now. Uh, yes, sir. So I uh, got, got out of school in August of 2014, uh, worked for National Oil Well for about a year and a half, and then I went up to Baltimore to work for Morgan Stanley for about a year, and then uh, I'm currently at Dell in our supply chain department working in finance and accounting there. And I understand you've got some hobbies that you're pursuing. Talk about this. Oh, absolutely. So in, uh, in my free time, I'm either um, chasing th 12 and 11 and 12-year-olds around, uh, just coaching the uh, helping and out. And we are talking about football players. Yes, yes sir. Yes. But, but, for the, but for the right reason, um, <laughs> I'm helping out. Let Cedar, the record show. Uh, yeah, Cedar Park's, uh, Cedar Park's youth sixth grade football team, you know, just helping them and uh, helping those kids out. I think, you know, when you talk about predominant, predominant high school programs it starts from that youth right and these kids yeah. the, the things the fundamentals that they're learning will carry on in the middle school and those schemes will carry on in the high school and that's how you have state championship programs so uh, it's my yeah my way of uh, it's kind of my way of giving back to the community well, that is terrific yeah. yeah well we've been talking with Holmes own coffee lifetime Timberwolf former Florida State Seminole about uh, what he's been doing since he left the Timberwolf football program after his 2009 senior season, and yeah. glad to have him back here. It's, it's yeah. now time for another short <laughs> yeah. break, and we'll be right back with more Timberwolf <laughs> Night in America right after this. Head to Majori's for food, drinks, and fun. They have specials almost every night, from $4 burgers to a dollar off on pastas to $7 Mexican night. And on Mondays, kids eat free. Bring the whole crew and have a great time at Majori's. They're a favorite hangout of a lot of Cedar Park football people, from fans to booster club folks to players to coaches. Great appetizers, pasta dishes, seafood, fresh green salads, burgers, pizza, sandwiches, buffalo wings, baby back ribs, stromboli, and more. Food, drinks, and fun at Majoris. Check them out at MagsTexas.com. In the battle for barbecue supremacy, warriors pit prime meats, secret sauces, and recipes against one another. Yet one champion stands alone. Rudy's Country Store and Barbecue in the modern day vernacular, where bad means good. Rudy's Country Store and Barbecue has the worst barbecue in Texas. Socialize with us. Yeah, man, I'll tell you what, that dang old internet, man, you just go on there and point and click, 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 click. It's real easy, man. On Twitter, at KMAC Sports, or catch us on Facebook. Search KMAC Sports. Just another way, KMAC Sports is bringing your teams to you. This is the KMAC Sports Network. All right, welcome back to Timberwolf Night in America live from the 613 and Majoris. Josh and Brad bringing you the stuff tonight live from the heart of Cedar Park. We've been talking with Cedar Park Royalty Lifetime, Timberwolf Holmes on Wakafi. And our current D line is next, but before we get to that conversation, a quick look at some other scores in the Austin area. First, from our own district, 11-5A, of course, Cedar Park got past Georgetown, as we said, 27-24. Timberwolves 5-2 and 3-0, and 
Hutting Hutto coming up next. Uh, Georgetown falls for the third straight time to go to 3-3 three and three overall, 0-2 oh in district after a 3-0 oh start. But I say they'll not lose again until sometime in the playoffs. The Eagles have already played the only teams in the district better than they are. They host Pflugerville Friday night at Berkelbach. Mainer over Rouse, 37-3. Things not looking good for Josh Mann and the Raiders, one of my favorite bands. Uh, Rouse falls to 2-5 and five and 0-3 oh and, and already out of the playoff money. Mainers 3-3 three and 2-0 three and, and, oh and may well become the fourth playoff team out of 11-5A. Both teams have Connolly next. Mustangs play the Cougs at the Field for Friday night. Raiders host them at the book next Friday night. Uh, Rouse has to buy this week. It's probably important to note that Maynard may be unbeaten in district play right now, but they have yet to play any of the three consensus best teams in the league, Cedar Park, Hutto, or Georgetown. I'll be surprised if they beat any of those teams. Uh, Pflugerville over their longtime arch rival Connolly, 48-34 in the backyard brawl at the Pafield. The Pafanthers uh, are something of a surprise. They go to 4-3 and three overall and 2-1 and one in district and are still in the playoff race. Connolly falls to 1-6 and 0-3. and, oh and three out of the race, but Peeville has yet to play Hutto or Cedar Park. Hutto's ranks number, uh, number seven in the AP poll and had the bye this week and was in attendance en masse watching our game with Georgetown at the Gup Friday night. Of course, there's Cedar Park's next opponent. That game will likely decide the district championship because the winner Friday night can afford one loss in his last couple of games and still take the league title anyway due to owning the tiebreaker of this win. Yeah, it's really, it's really going to shake up really interesting as, as we get to the end of the season. In the current 11-5A standing, Cedar Park sitting up at top 5-2 and two overall, 3-0 and oh in district. The Hippos right behind us sitting at 2-0 and oh in district because they had the bye week last week. Maynard Mustangs uh, right there tied for first, I guess, in district second. play. Or second place at 2-0. and oh. And then Pflugerville, Georgetown, or Pflugerville at 2-1 and one in district, Georgetown 0-2. Oh Rouse and Connolly 0 and 3. That's going to be interesting to see how that shakes up at the end with Pflugerville, Georgetown, and Maynard with all them playing each other and just seeing how it shakes out. You know, if they drew the line at under number four right now, the season ended tonight. The playoff teams are Cedar Park, Hutto, Maynard, and Pflugerville. Interesting. But Georgetown's 0 and 2, and again, they've played the two toughest teams, and I, I think they're better than Maynard or Pflugerville or Rouse or Connolly, and those are the four teams they got left. I think that uh, they're going to climb from 0 and 2 to something like 4 and 2. And, and, and finish third. It's either Maynard or Peeville is going to come out as the number four team, I think, and grab that final playoff slot, it looks to me. Mm. All right, other scores of interest. Westlake had the week off the previous week in preparation for their huge class with Lake Travis last Friday night, and I guess it helped. A 40-14 to 14 crushing of the Cavalier by the Chaps. When was the last time Lake Travis has been crushed? LT had been ranked number two in the state in 6A football and had frankly, beaten their two common opponents more impressively than had Westlake. But Taylor Anderson, Chaps quarterback, with big numbers for them and a huge win. Westlake's now number eight in the AP poll that came out today. Lake Travis, number nine. If they could have figured out how to make both teams lose, that would have been perfect. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been a perfect ending. Vandegrift cruised past McNeil, 48-14. I told you a few weeks ago, after they got by both Cedar Ridge and Hendricks in their first two district games, that there were no good teams left on the Vipers' schedule, and they would likely finish the regular season 10-0 and and earn their first outright district championship. I'm still right about that. They're now 7-0 and and 5-0, and ranked number 15 in the AP poll with three games left against teams that are collectively 7-12, and Westwood, Leander, and Stony Point. The only team with any chance at all of upsetting them, Stony in the finale. That game will be at the Palmer Palace. Uh, well, that helps our RPI, right? Yeah. Of, somebody beat us goes 10-0, okay, and they're 6-8. Uh, Vista Ridge falls to Stony Point, 44 to nothing. Ooh. Rangers, 1-6, and 1-4, and 13-6A. And what has happened at Vista Ridge? The Glen Grizzlies, four straight wins now. They've not lost since September 7th. They beat Cedar Creek last week, 34-10. to 10. They are 4-2 and two overall and lead District 13-5 AD2 at 3-0. Uh, man, they, they haven't lost a game in over a month. After starting 0-2, Rob Shanefield's team has now scored 162 points in the last four games, and they're averaging 44 a game in district play. That, he was our offensive coordinator once, after all. Uh, they host Eastview this week at the book. Their game with Bastrop, potentially for the district title, is the last night of the regular season. Our former O-Cord, Shane Field, doing a terrific job up there on North Baghdad. And that is so exciting for them. It, excited to have that success and just – 
coming off that Cedar Park tree. I'm just saying, a lot of success around that tree. I, I'm thinking of going to watch them play the night mm -hmm. of our bye next Friday night. That's kind of what I'm thinking of going to do, seeing yeah. them play. All right, and checking on our former head coaches that are now at other locales. Joe Willis, Colleyville Heritage Panthers, fell last week to one of the top teams in the state. Denton Ryan, 45-30. They're 3-3 three three overall, 2-1 and one in district. They face 0-6 Carrollton Turner this week. Sounds like a lawyer. That'll be a blowout. Uh, Chris Ross's Red Oak Hawks and their OC, Brad Willard, who <laughs> beat an undefeated team last Friday night in Dallas oh, Kimball, 26-12. Hawks now 5-1 and one overall, 2-1, and one, and in third in their district, they will play 4-2 and two Dallas Adamson Friday now. Okay, a quick check now that we've got some data on the strength of our non-district schedule. As always, all four teams are a classification above ours, 6A. Vandy, as we said, now 7-0. and oh. Cedar Ridge, 4-2. and two. San Angelo Central is 5-2 and two with their only their loss to a 5A or at a 6A power, Euless Trinity. And Cinco Ranch won the next two games after they played us by large margins after falling to us. But they're only 2-5 and five overall and will finish still second or third in their district, which will be won by perennial state title contender Katie. So our four non-district opponents are collectively 18 and 9, 16 and 4 if you don't count Cinco Ranch by the other three. By comparison, here's Hutto's track record against their non-district opposition. A 21-point win over 2-4 and four West Mesquite. A 1-point overtime win over 4A Liberty Hill. And a 2-point win over 3-3 three three Houston Lamar. Their other non-district game was uh, eaten by the weather. So nobody go running off thinking Hutto is any sort of big favorite to win this game this week. Our non-district competition is a heck of a lot better than theirs, and their results were not anything to write home about. All right, now let's bring in one of the main components of the Black Rain defense, the place where the rubber meets the road, where it all starts, way up front, the Cedar Park defensive line. We have Jacob Munoz, Ben Bell, Josiah Whittington, Ben Blankenship, Joshua Slowey, B.J. Jones, and with them, Coaches Jason James and Samuel Four, and as usual, we like to start with the coaches first. Uh, Jason James, where did you get off to? We're going to get you on this mic first and talk to you a little bit about your D-line. You've been here a few years now in Cedar Park and kind of gotten into the culture. And uh, how are things going with this D-line? How are you liking this? Uh, pretty good. This is, a, this is a fun group of guys. We've got some uh, returners from last year, so some good experience. But uh, we have a good time, but we work hard and they're fun to get after it with. Now, I know you were with us on the show for one episode last year. Yes, but, sir. you know, our fan base turns over 25% every year. People graduate out the top and come in on the bottom. So tell fans who don't know your journey, where you went to high school, college, athletic history, how you ended up at Cedar Park. Okay. Um, it's kind of a, a longer story as far as where it started. And uh, I was actually born here in Austin. I uh, went to Cedar Park around here. My parents split. Uh, my mom moved up to the northeast. So I went up there with her, with my stepfather. And I went to high school in Connecticut, <laughs> long way from here, uh, and then came back, went to UT, um, and then graduated there and started at Cedar Park Middle School in 2008. And then I started at the high school in 2015. You were one of the coaches that uh, Coach Absec hired when Joe Willis went and half of his coaches went with him and the other half went with Chris Ross and yes, had sir. to hire a whole staff and you were one of those guys. Yes, sir. I'd, uh, I'd worked with the D-line the whole time. I'd worked with Coach Q and Coach Britton wanted me to come in and kind of continue on what had already been built and that's kind of where that went. So tell us a little bit about your D-line. What, what is their strength this year and what do they still need to work on? Uh, I feel like, uh, you know, depth is our strength. Um, you know, we got a lot of guys that can contribute in a lot of different ways and are pretty versatile. Um, you know, they're, they're really unselfish. Uh, you know, everybody wants to play all the time, but some guys get more opportunities. And, you know, one week one guy may get, you know, several reps, and then the next week he may not get any. It just kind of depends on the flow of the game. Uh, but everybody's ready to do their job. Uh, and just, you know, the camaraderie that we have as a group, I think they take a lot of pride in that, and they really get along well. And I think it shows on the field and the way that they play. Who's the biggest troublemaker in this group? Who do you got to yell oh. at the most? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Everybody's looking around at each other. They're not going to do anything, do you? Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, they all take their turns. <laughs> That's, uh, it really just depends on the day, um, and it's all for different things, but uh, they all mean well. You know, they're, uh, they are kids after all, and, you know, we all make mistakes, but uh, usually they try to do well after that and get it fixed, but uh, it's generally not the same thing over and over. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot, Jason. James, one of the D-line coaches. Now let's hand the mic to the other one, Samuel uh, Four. Samuel, you're, you're a new guy on staff this uh, year, Yes, right? sir, I am. 
Where, how did you get to Cedar Park? Well, it's kind of a long story, uh, much like Coach James. I'm, well, I'm not originally from Texas. I was born in Flint, Michigan. Got here and, as fast as you could. Yes, sir, absolutely. Uh, I coached for one year high school football up at my alma mater, Davison High School, which is in Davison, Michigan, and uh, came here, came to Austin by way of Odessa. I was uh, coaching for the Bronchos out there at Odessa for two years, and uh, then Westwood the last four years, and ah. now I'm here at Cedar Park. When you look at this defensive line, what what strikes you is is uh, you know the main ingredient that this D line has to get after so many quarterbacks. Honestly, uh, the incredible violence and work ethic that <laughs> that's awesome. our D line brings. Um, the th I, that's kind of our thing is uh, we want to be violent and we want to work as ha or harder than anybody else in in our area in Texas and in the country and. Uh, I want to be violent. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And so, uh, Coach, we're and it is an, it is an incredible thing to see. Not many places I've ever been have had the level of work ethic and, of course, the level of violence and get after it <laughs> that these guys have. You said violence three times. I like this. Oh, that, that's that's good. And that's fresh on the vocabulary. I feel very lucky. And so, Coach, where do you get some of your inspirations when you're coaching techniques and stuff like that? Who do you like to pull from? Where do you? Oh, your I, mean, I mean, just uh, we watched a lot of video uh, just from what we do, but also uh, lots of things on Twitter and stuff like that that we find that we, you know, share with the kids, uh, showing them just anything from the Packers, defensive line, Steelers, uh, anything from those guys, just how incredibly aggressive that they can be with their hand placement and their footwork that really, you know, turn situations that they can capitalize on and really get after the quarterback. All right, thanks a lot, Coach Samuel Four, new man on the staff, helping uh, Jason James coach this D-line. And now, why don't we come in, go ahead, we'll, we'll bring, and, and, and let's, everybody who's going to be on the mic, let's sit right about here. We're going to make sure that we try not to get too much feedback from the speaker that's under the table. And, uh, and this is the guy that we've talked about so often this year that has the uh, his unbreakable motor. And Mooney, why don't you, everybody who gets here, tell your name and number for people who are listening. Uh, so my name is Jacob Munoz. I'm number 55, and I'm the defensive end for Easy Park. The double nickel. And uh, this guy, man, Josh, we like watching this guy move. There's just an unreal motor that you have that nobody else has. And it just to see the way that you get up after a play, let's say that, like, what drives you, Jacob, to sometimes you might not win your one-on-one. -on -one. Sometimes you get blown back. And what drives you to get up the next play and keep going? What, what gets you going? It's really all about just the mindset, how you approach it. You know, I'd, I'd prob I'll probably never be the biggest man on the field <laughs> ever. But just looking at it, it's how you play. It's are you going to sit there and dwell on it? Or are you going to get back up and go after it again? Because you got, you got a whole game to play. Right. I've seen you take guys bigger than you and throw them out of your way. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Just like yeah, it's nothing. Yeah, like a matter of course, right? Well, yeah. I like that answer. What's your favorite thing to do as a D-linesman? Violence. <laughs> Violence! Oh, it trickles down. It starts to top. Just, just, you know, you get to hit someone every single play. And that's the thing about, like, football. It's like... Do you really just want to sit there and run around the whole time, or do you want to get down and dirty and just go straight forward? You don't have to think that much, which is awesome. That, and you yes. get to hit somebody every play. Yes. That does sound good. I should have been a D-linesman. That's yeah, right. No, it's great. You know, Jacob, you and I spent some time talking on the sidelines of the GUP at a JV game uh, last week, I guess. And, and it, it, it sounds like if, if there was some other role that might be handed to you on the football team as an experiment sometime, you might not say no. What would that be? I don't know. Um, Coach Absec might hurt me if I say it because he laughs at me. <laughs> no. But, no, I, I mean, a chance at running it. And running the football, yeah, maybe. Yeah. Give I'd the like rock. To see that. It's there. You know, it's there's a tradition there. here of great yeah. defensive players with great motors like this guy yeah. going to the offense and running the ball between the tackles. You got Tyler Levine was a linebacker. Thomas Hutchings. Thomas yeah. Hutchings is a linebacker. <laughs> Thomas Middleton was Thomas a linebacker. Middleton. We should have had Holmes run the ball. Yeah, oh, Holmes that would have been, been terrifying. They don't let us play two ways in Texas. Oh. Yeah, oh, okay. <laughs> no, okay. I don't think so. They don't. <laughs> All right, thanks, thanks a lot. Jacob Munoz, number 55, and hand the mic over. Next guy come in. I know who this is, too, but tell everybody uh, who you are. This is Sasquatch. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, my name is Josiah Whittington. I'm number 90 for Cedar Park. And you've been uh, a fixture on the D-line for a couple of years now. Mm -hmm. 
What's your favorite thing to do as a D-linesman? I mean, <laughs> uh, there's no, like, there's no holding back. You get to pin your ears back every play. And violence. <laughs> That's you. You hear that word? It's the fifth time. Yeah, yeah you hear they're that not word saying violins, Paul. <laughs> it's not. A... Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's the, like the mentality of playing defensive line is that nobody can block me. You know, and I'm going to win over and over and over again. And that's just the way the game's going to go. So far this season, who who's been the best offensive line that y'all have gone against? Um. They're all they're all pretty like all the teams that we've played. They're all pretty similar O lines. I'd say the best was uh, for me Georgetown because I, I switched from D N to nose guard. Um, that's just a different ball game itself. So right. for me, me personally, it would be Georgetown. So you're a senior. Uh, what do you got planned for after high school? Uh, I want to play at the next level. Um, really, anywhere that. Want to pay? <laughs> hey, um, there you go. I want. I want to study psychology. So uh, where, wherever, <laughs> wherever I can take that in life. So. And I, I found out. I guess it was last year when I was walking a dog or something in our neighborhood. I was walking by, and and Josiah lives like down the street and around the corner from me. And I never knew that all this time. Lucky. Yeah. <laughs> I saw him you know, taking some groceries in from the car in the house. I said, "That's Sasquatch." <laughs> And the, the the big three or four bags he has probably his lunch. Right. Well, yes. Right, right, yes. Right, taken right, in there. Right. Yep. All right. What school do you got in mind? Maybe if, you know if you're gonna play football or even if you're not. Let's uh, say nobody comes knocking. Where would you like to go to school? Well, uh, East Texas Baptist up in Marshall uh, gave me a, a, a scholarship. So um, that's, that's that's the plan then. Yeah, right? it's it's a great school. It's where Joe Willis played. Uh, that's you know like Tarleton would be a great one. Uh, University of Arkansas uh, would be a great school to go to. Um, and being like a like a military kid, any academy would be like a oh, dream yeah. school. So, yeah, yep. we sent some guys to Air Force. We sent some guys oh, to yeah. West Point. We sent at least one guy to uh, uh, Annapolis. Yep. Yeah. Well, best of luck with that, Josiah Whittington. Thank you. Squatch. All right, go ahead and turn the mic over to the next guy. Come up to the seat, the hot seat here, and tell us number and name of the people who are listening. Uh, I'm Rashard Jones. Uh, you know, we're number 53. And you go by BJ mostly, right? Yes, sir. Or do you want to start calling you Bashar? Uh, well, I've always been called uh, BJ. Okay. But it's kind of weird, like Bashar Jones Jones. <laughs> Bashar Jones Jones. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> BJJ. <laughs> BJ squared. <laughs> so... Now, you have an interesting journey because you've been on the other side, too, yes, on the offensive line. And yes, sir. Tell, I, I, that's got to kind of give you some extra insights as to how to defeat an offensive line because you're on the other side trying not to be defeated. Yes, sir. So, uh, so like, after last year, playing D-line the whole season and uh, being, like, I guess, like, getting after it every play and all that like stuff and getting, like, first-team audition as a D-line. And then offseason, we, like, we had a lot of uh, seniors graduate last year. Like Jonathan Kelly and all those guys, and uh, we, I guess we just wanted to get, make our O line the best it could be, like all, all around together. So they asked me to play O line, and I just said yes, I will. Whatever's best for the team, in order for us to win as many games as we can. And then uh, whenever that happened, uh, I played for the first four games out of district. You know, did what I had to do to, make, to help our team out. And then uh, whenever regular season came back around, I got the chance to play defense again. <laughs> Finally, yeah. Uh, oh, <laughs> yes, sir. Sounds like a sigh of relief. <laughs> yes, sir. So, so it's like uh, getting you hit back. somebody instead of get hit, right? Yeah, yes, sir. So it's like getting back into uh, getting back and like being violent and uh, getting back into I don't really know what the word is, but just being back with like with who I started off with and uh, being able to get after people and stuff like that. I think you're playing mostly over the center now as the nose guard. Yes, right? sir. I've been playing nose guard. Yes, sir. Well, what's your favorite moment so far as a Timberwolf? What was someone play or some other experience? My favorite moment. Um, my favorite moment was probably last year Georgetown. Mm. Cole Holland got an interception. And, oh, yes, sir. Took it to the house, and then I got a chance to lay out. Oh, <laughs> one of one of Georgetown guards. Oh, oh yeah, that was so good. That felt amazing. Yes, I might remember that. It seems like there was some great uh, block well, here in Cole's return. You can actually return. go back and find it on the archive. Yeah, we go back to the archive and watch it again. <laughs> yes, sir. So you're a senior, right? Yes, sir. What are your plans after high school? Um, right now is just uh, getting back into like sitting my film out to 
coaches because like all every time a coach asks me for my phone, I send my phone from last year. And they ask me, you have any phone from this year? I'm, and I'm like, I have a line of film. That's not what they're looking for. Yeah. So I just have to send my film out more. And uh, but if that doesn't work out, f football, I'm probably gonna end up going to either to like Texas Tech, Texas Tech or Texas State, something like that. Well, maybe this week you get a lot of. Hits behind the line on Chooks Nobuko, and you can send oh, yeah. those oh, yeah. out, right? And that, that's two. You all right. Is that oh, no. <laughs> BJ Jones. Yes, sir. Most Thanks definitely. a lot. Can't all right. Wait. BJ, if you'll hand the mic to the next guy, we'll get him up here, give the name and number, and they'll, we'll put them in the hot seat and, and keep this conversation going. Okay, who are you and what's your number? My name is Ben Bell. My number is 99. Ben Bell. Number one in our hearts. Oh, yeah. Oh, thanks. You, uh, you've you got a little older brother action going with this program, too, right? Yes, sir. He was a pretty good guy out there, too. Did, did, what do you guys do in the backyard to play football? You're, you're both defensive linemen. Oh, we, we always just always butted heads. We're just best friends, and we always just go at it. A lot of, rest, <laughs> a lot of wrestling instead of football, probably, right? Yes. <laughs> so I, I think you're just a junior, though, right? Yes, sir. Are you starting to make any plans for what you want to do afterwards? Uh, I just want to get a scholarship anywhere I can. Anywhere, honestly. Football or anything, right? Yes, sir. I was say, you're wearing a sweatshirt, and that's a state championship wrestling? Well, or? not state champion, but I did go to state. Nice. But that's yeah. pretty good, no, yeah. No. I know you're a pretty good wrestler, too. Your, your brother was a pretty good wrestler. Yeah, just what? a state champ. Nothing that, special. See, that's, that's, that's what would it'd be tough to be wrestling with your brother in the backyard. He's a state champ. Dang it. Dad, come out here and help me. All right. Ben Bell, what, if we were to ask you, because I'm about to, what would you say? Who is the funniest guy on the D-line? My boy, Charles. <laughs> Charles Blankenship. <laughs> yes, All right, sir. we're going to have him with a mic here in just a second. We'll get, get your we'll jokes see. ready. So get your jokes ready. Be thinking of something <laughs> clever to say. You're on the broadcast. What's your favorite moment so far, Ben? You, you've had a lot of great plays on defense this year, I know. Honestly, just every play is a great moment. Like, every time I get to be on the field, it's just a great opportunity, and I just want to strive to be better than my brother. So that's my great moment. There you go. That's a big motivator, right? This is a guy oh, yeah. who had older brothers play in this program. Oh, so competitive. It's so much, so much fun when you have your real brother there with your brothers. Follow that. All right, thanks. Ben Bell, all right? Hand the mic over now to the funniest guy on the D-line. No pressure. Name and number. Hello, my name is Charles Blankenship. I'm number 92. <laughs> See, there, there you go. That was funny, and you didn't even think it was going to be funny. <laughs> so wh why would somebody like Ben Bell say that Charles is the funniest guy on the line? Uh, I don't know. Um, actually, it's probably because of all the time we spend bonding together. I'm with this guy like 14 hours a day sometimes. Just so. make him laugh, huh? Yeah, Got through school and stuff like that. <laughs> now, are you're we're, we're all best friends. You're a senior, too? Are you a senior or junior? No, I'm a junior. You're a junior, so you, you and Ben are both back next year. Oh, I, I like hearing when good guys yes, are coming back. That's going to be a lot of fun. What, what's your best moment so far as a Timberwolf? Um, it was probably versus San Angelo when um, I jumped off sides on the extra point. So they went for two, and then... I got to stick the guy on the goal line. Oh, that's terrific. So you set him up. <laughs> yeah. You set him up. It was, it was he's all not all just dazzle. funny, he's it bright. Was, yeah. It was all on purpose. Wait, watch this, watch this. <laughs> Jump. That's so I got beautiful. To make play. That's beautiful. We've called your name a lot this year. Glad to see you making big plays. What, uh, you know, you, no pass, no play, so you've got to keep the nose of the grindstone academically at Cedar Park, and we usually lead the state in academic all-state players. But let's turn that in a little different direction. What class do you dislike the most at CPHS? Uh, I'd probably have to say, oh, this is, this is touchy because I can't. You don't know if the teacher's listening? Yeah. <laughs> end, of the grade, end of the grading period. <laughs> I need these grades to be up, you know. <laughs> okay, you, you love them all then, right? <laughs> yes, sir. There you go. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ben Blankenship. All right, Ben, if you'll. Uh, Charles. Ben Blankenship. I, I'm thinking of his buddy Ben yeah, Bell. Mix, uh, his so buddy Charles Bell. Bell. <laughs> Charles Bell and Ben Blankenship. See, they do spend a lot of time again. Charles, if you'll uh, find, uh, find someone near you to hand the mic to and Thank let them get in that hot seat for a second. And Charles, one last question. I know you don't have the mic. Is Charles how you'd prefer to go? Nobody calls you Chuck. Charlie? Charles is fine. You can call me whatever. I don't care.
call him whatever. Well, well, well I just called you Ben, so I'm going to stick with that. <laughs> All right, name and number. All right, I'm Joshua Slowey, and I'm number 51. Speaking of brothers in the program, Nate Slowey's brother here. Hey. So what did you guys do when you are playing football in the backyard? Uh, he beat me up 90% <laughs> of the time. <laughs> I was the guy taking the beatings, and my dad would get on Nathan because I was always getting beat up. But what, uh, What's the year's difference between the two of you? As crazy as it is, it's mostly just size. We're literally the same person. But, I mean, how much older is he than you? Oh, he's only three years older than me. Three years. Okay, I was thinking that's what it was. Have you always been a defensive linesman? Yes, sir. Now, was he always a defensive linesman? How did you all end up that? Was Dad a defensive linesman? <laughs> no, my Dad didn't even play football. Wow. So where's, what was your motivation? How, how, why are you playing football? Mostly my brother. You know, he, and you found out it was fun. Yeah. And you get to hurt. I mean, hit people. I mean, yeah. And be violent. Yes, sir. <laughs> Big part of it. What's your favorite moment in this football program so far? Just all the winning. <laughs> just like being here and winning football games, right? Yet to come. It's fun. Just being with my friends. Uh, uh, time on the field. You're still an underclassman or are you a yes, senior? Sir, I'm a junior. Junior? What do, you, uh, what do you enjoy studying in the curriculum? The opposite question from uh, Ben Blankenship's question. <laughs> uh, mostly math. I'm a math guy. Like math? You know, we've had a lot of guys, uh, a lot of players who've come through, you know, we've had every position here. A lot of them say that their favorite subject is math. And, man, is that ever important for the United States of America or what? Yeah. Not my, not my forte. So it I'm wasn't glad, mine glad it's yours. I'm glad it's yours. <laughs> what are you thinking of studying when you get to college? Uh, mechanical engineering. So that's what you want to do? Yes, sir. What kind of things does a mechanical engineer do? All kind of build buildings, build bridges, uh, all kinds of stuff, huh? The thing me and my older brother usually do is, me and my older brother, we always used to work on cars with our dad, and that's that's our thing. Got you mechanically inclined, then, that way. Yeah, just building stuff. Things that go fast, especially. All right. Another slowy in the program. That's cool. It's awesome. All right, thanks a lot. And if we'll turn our mic over to the next guy in line and put him on the hot seat, give us your name and number. I'm Chase Grossman, number 54. Chase Grossman. Yes, sir. So w what position are you on the end? Are you in the middle? I, I play nose, and I'm a long snapper. And what class are you? I'm a junior. Long snapper, too, huh? Yes, sir. Now, that's an interesting job that not a lot of people get. How did you get to be a long snapper? Uh, Coach Ford just kind of threw me in there. He says, I need you. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> Here, bend over. <laughs> that's exactly how I became the holder. <laughs> Oh. oh! Now, now Josh has some experience. Oh yeah, with long snappers working with him because he was a holder for all those years. So I held the kicker's balls. <laughs> <laughs> so Josh, what's imp what is it important for a long snapper to do from the holder's perspective? Oh, tight spiral, baby! Come on, don't let it wobble all the way back. You want it nice and clean. Get it up. Don't roll it to me. Speed. Speed. Yeah. So, how many times you work on the long snapping chore? Um, well, every time the offense has the ball, I, I snap. You get oh, over there and start working. After it. As soon as they have the ball, So, I wait, snap. are you deep snap or? Uh, for punt. For, for punt. punt. No, no extra point and field goal stuff, just punt? I was, and then kind of went away. <laughs> okay. Oh, lost that duty. <laughs> <laughs> so, now, are, are you the only long snapper? Uh, no, there's a whole list of them. Oh, okay, <laughs> okay, okay. Now, I would think that as, as either of those snappers, field goals, extra points, or punts, um, I think I'm getting my ass knocked over as soon as I snap that ball every time. It, how, how, do you, how do you keep that from happening? Uh, well, my job is to snap the ball and run down the field as fast as I can. <laughs> but what I'm saying is you're I imagine you do that pretty there well. looking this way, and, <laughs> and there's some guy right there ready to send you to Kalamazoo. How do you avoid that happening to you? Well, the ref usually says don't touch the center for about a second, so I take all that one second. Really? To <laughs> I've, never, I've never heard that. Do they really do that? <laughs> That's fascinating. All you need is a window, baby. <laughs> it's fascinating. <laughs> What's your uh, plans for uh, after school? What class are you, first of all? I'm a junior. Junior, so you're back. I'd love to hear that. What are you going to be doing after high school? Uh, I plan on doing either business management or business associates. Any school in mind in particular? Uh, Auburn. 
Auburn. Why Auburn? Long ways away. Uh, well, I lived there, and I've visited campus a couple times. It's just... Got any family in the area? Um, my grandfather lives there. All right. Terrific. All right, now, if you'll go ahead and pass the mic to the next guy. Name and number for our fans listening out there. Uh, my name's Hunter Hewitt, and I'm number 94. And Hunter, we called your name a few times this year. What's been your favorite moment as a Cedar Park Timberwolf? Probably whenever I was playing JV and I got to light somebody up on punt. Mm. And at the same time, I hurt my leg, so I couldn't kick PAT, unfortunately. Oh, so you kick as well, huh? It, yeah, I'm third string kicker. Third string kicker. <laughs> That seems to be an entertaining reply. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Munoz really likes this. Why is he laughing so much at you being a third string kicker? He's jealous. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. He, he wanted to be the third string kicker. <laughs> <laughs> so, what's. Uh, oh, are, are you junior? You're junior. Uh, right? I'm a sophomore. You're a sophomore. Huh? You could be yes, here sir. for a while. Pretty good sized guy. Going to grow a little bit more. Um. What's, uh, what is it you like about being on the D-line? Uh, I just like how I don't have to think a lot, and I can just kind of go forward and Third like, guy who said that. fit right and just go hit somebody. Just not think? Just th do you like pass rush or, or run defense better? Um, pass rush, mainly because I'm a lot better at it than uh, run, because I, I tend to keep a high pad level, and it's easier to deal with that on a pass. You know, I, I should have been asking that a little more often to some of these other players, see who likes pass rushing and who likes run defense better. Mm. What's been your favorite moment in one of the games so far? Uh, my very first time I kicked a PAT on JV. Uh, I lined up, very nervous, had a cast on. I look up, look down, almost cried, and then I kicked the ball and it went through the PATs. And it was pretty was cool. It, was, was it hard to, to make <laughs> the kick accurate with that cast on? Or? Yeah, it was, it was pretty <laughs> difficult. <laughs> just ice in your veins, just right through the uprights. Yep. <laughs> uh, too bad you can't do P for K on an extra point. Mm -hmm. So what are your plans? What, what, what class are you in? Are you, oh, you said sophomore. I'm going to go. What, uh, what are your plans afterwards? What do you want to study? And um, I want to be a marine biologist, Ooh. hopefully. That's my plans for after high school if I don't get a football scholarship. Any particular school you want to go to to do that? Uh, I haven't really looked into it much. I just know that I want to be a marine biologist. All right, a marine biologist. Thanks a lot. Uh, ben Blankenship here. Um, <laughs> I, I just, I just got to do that. He's on a roll. <laughs> if you'll go ahead and take the, We got anybody we haven't gotten yet? That's it. Is that, is that it? Is that everybody? Okay, all right. <laughs> Any comments before we go on to the next item? Uh, that's an this is a good group. group. That's an interesting I love group. It. Good group. All right, um, let's see. Time. I've got a, a bit of a rant tonight. It's, it's, it's a little bit close to home. Uh, we get to experience something as fans of this program that most simply do not get to do. Head coach Carl Absek magnanimously gives an hour or so of his time every Wednesday night to show game film highlights of the previous game and preview films of the coming opponent. He provides all sorts of insider analysis and takes all questions. It is a tremendous opportunity for fans to get terrific up-close information about their favorite team. And my rant is that very few of you are taking advantage of it. The last couple of weeks, there have been about six or seven people there, and three of them are sitting right here tonight. Me, Steve Groves, and Craig Weems. This is my rant. If you call yourself a serious high school football fan and your favorite team is the Cedar Park Timberwolves and you are not showing up for this in the football building back at campus at 645 every Wednesday night, then what the hell is wrong with you? No. Oh. Now, I understand that if you're a dad that's been coaching a lot of these kids when they're in youth football and you're sitting in the stands every Friday night yelling, what are we doing every time a tactic or a play is executed that you don't agree with? Coming to this and hearing Carl Absek describe the detailed operations of this team each game will make you unable to ever act that way again. But come on. 
Who wouldn't want to take advantage of a chance to shoot questions at the measurably best high school coach in this measurably best state for high school football in the nation? Shame on any of you that think you're a real high school football fan or a real Timberwolf fan who has an hour to spare on Wednesday nights and doesn't spend it with Coach Absec enjoying game film and talking the intricate details of high school football. The next one is tomorrow night, 645. Get there! You'll be smarter Friday night when you're watching the game. Boom. Mic drop. Yeah, we need the sound effect of a not mic bro- drop because we don't really want to drop any of our mics. That's perfect. All right. Now our favorite segment of the show. We're going to run a little long tonight. We're about 12 minutes behind schedule. We had a lot of guys to talk to, but that's okay. Uh, we're going to play one of our trivia games with the guys. We're going to play quotes from football movies. And we're going to split up a, into two teams. One's going to be captained by, uh, let's see, Coach James. Coach James. And the other's going to be captained by Holmes Onwakafi. And uh, let's see, we're going to do, raise your hand if you're a defensive tackle, a nose guard. Raise your hand. Raise your hand if you're a nose guard. Raise your hands. I know there's got nose guards there, not that many. Okay, so everybody else is a defensive end. There's a nose guard. Okay, then let's raise your hand if you're an underclassman. I mean, it's the same guys. It's the same guys. I'm trying to find a way to divide it up here. Uh, raise your hand if your birthday is on an odd-numbered date, like the ninth. Yeah, we'll, we'll go that. Just the odd-numbered birthday guys go with Coach James, all right? So hang, hang around Coach James. And everyone else has got an even-numbered birthday. We're going to go over here with Holmes. That's how we'll divvy him up. And we're going to play this game. Now, let me get <laughs> my thing up. Let's see. It's, uh, where is it? Where is that thing? Okay, I'm going to have to dig here for my file. I should have had that prepped, but it won't take too long to get there. We're going to play a game where I'm going to offer all kinds of uh, quotes about football, mainly from football-based movies. And you guys are going to guess what movie it's from. Mm. Let's see. Oh, I'm in the wrong year there. Oh, there we are. There we go. We'll do the five-inning game. We'll do the five-inning game. We're going to have five guests back and forth. I'll pick out a quote. I'll quote it. And Josh will play the Jeopardy music while we're waiting. No, we no Jeopardy music tonight. Walk you with and the YouTube. We'll, we'll have Holmes' team go first. And uh, here is your movie quote. Guess what movie this is. Ready? I wish I could think of something to say that was classy or inspirational, but I'll just say this. Pain heals. Chicks dig scars. And glory lasts forever. What movie was that? It's a football movie. I wish I could think of something to say that was classy or inspirational, but I'll just say this. Pain heals. Chicks dig scars. And glory lasts Last Coach James forever. is going wild. Oh, he knows that one, huh? Longest yard? No. No. Oh. We'll give it to Coach James if he thinks he can get it. The replacement. Shane Falco and the replacements. Nice. Right. Good for the steal. Good for the steal. Okay. And now it's your turn. You can get, your, get another point if you guess this next one. Here it is. Well, on a fake draw screen right, I uh, pick up the linebacker if he's coming. Unless, of course, it's Butkus, and I simply notify the quarterback to send for a preacher. Well, on a fake draw screen right, I uh, pick up the linebacker if he's coming. Unless, of course, it's Butkus. Then I simply notify the quarterback to send for a preacher. What football movie was that? One of the most famous of all football movies. Steve Groves knows it, but he's not playing. All right, give us, give us a guess then. Brian's song is correct. Brian's song is correct. Oh, that was an audience member? Nah. No, 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 no. Can't do that. All right, back over to a Team Onwa Coffee. Let's see what we got here. All right. We will be perfect in every aspect of the game. You drop a pass, you run a mile. You miss a blocking assignment, yes, yes. Remember the Titans for Holmes. You're killing me, Petey. Holmes, you're (laughs) killing me, Petey. It's one to one. Right here. Let's see. All right, now, this line was spoken by an actor playing the part of someone who was once our halftime guest on a broadcast of one of our games. 
specifically Cedar Park beating Stony Point in 2009. Oh. Oh my you might gosh. not know that. That man was Jack Langiel. Now, here is the line the actor playing Jack Langiel spoke in this movie. Here it is. This is for Coach James' team. When you take that field today, you've got to lay that heart on the line, men. From the soles of your feet, with every ounce of blood you've got in your body, lay it on the line until that final whistle blows. And if you do that, we cannot lose. If you play like that, we cannot be defeated. Now, there are six young men and 69 others who will not be on the field with you today, but they'll be watching. You can bet your ass that they'll be gritting their teeth with every snap of that football. You understand me? How you play today from this moment on is how you will be remembered. This is your opportunity to rise from those ashes and grab glory that will live forever. Ready to play. Sorry. Oh, God. That gets me going. Yeah. Snapped out of it. So who said that? What mo or actually, what movie was that in? We Are Marshall. We are Marshall. Oh, that's not winning. Fine. All right. Uh, uh, do you happen to know who the actor was who said that line? All right, all right, all right. Yeah, that's all right. Matthew McConaughey. That's right. <laughs> so it's two to one, James' team leading the Onwell Coffee team. Okay, here we go. Uh, let's see. All right, here it is. Own one coffee team. You know how I used to tell you about Van Buren scoring that touchdown back in 48? That touchdown got me through 30 years at that factory. Got me through all those times, your mother being sick. When I told you not to get your hopes up, it didn't mean that I wasn't. Who said, or what movie was that from? Money. What movie was that from? You know how I used to tell you about Van Buren scoring that touchdown back in 48? That touchdown got me through 30 years at that factory. Got me through all those times, your mother being sick. When I told you not to get your hopes up, didn't mean that I wasn't. What was that from? No, Invincible. Invincible. <laughs> all right, for Team James, here comes the next one. This is a short one. They're fast, they're big, they're dirty, plus they're fast. They're fast, they're big, they're dirty, plus they're fast. What movie was that one from? Friday Night Lights. Friday Night Lights. Coach James is up three to one over Team Onwa Coffee. Okay. Two more. Here's the next one for Team Onwa Coffee. Son, in 35 years of religious study, I have only come up with two hard, incontrovertible facts. There is a God, and I'm not him. Rudy it is. Rudy it is. Man, you guys, everybody's doing great here. <laughs> Three to two, our score. All right, for Team James. If you so much as set foot downtown, you will be sorry. I'm in a prayer group with the DA. I'm a member of the NRA, and I am always packing. The blind side. Man, you guys are you watch, you watch it. <laughs> we, we have played this game <laughs> in right. seasons past with, with position groups, and it's been like one to nothing sometimes. It's, you guys watch your football movies. You watch your football movies. Okay, next one. All right, here we go. This is for t Mobile Coffee. Good luck in Aggieville. God knows you ain't good enough to play for Texas. What movie was that from? Good luck in Aggieville. God knows you ain't good enough to play for Texas. Holmes says the Junction Boys, and that's the correct answer. Dang! Put them up, put them up, put them up. <laughs> Team Ome McAfee has come from behind to take the lead four to three. <laughs> All right, here's the next one for Team James. Another short one. This is spoken by, uh, 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 by uh, Lawrence Taylor, who had, was a cameo here. Which brings to me, oh, excuse me, let's try it again. Which brings me to my second point, boys. Don't do crack. It is. Yes. It's the water boy. <laughs> four to four. <laughs> All right, here we go. They, you...
You know, you might be right, but you're going to have to blame it on me for probably marking one down wrong. It's kind of like when the referee makes a mistake, you got to live with it anyway. So we are probably mistakenly tied, and that shouldn't have been a P.I. penalty or something like that. <laughs> First team to get the next two points wins. All right, here's the next one. And where are we? We're with you guys? Right? Okay, here it is. It is an up-at-dawn, pride-swallowing siege that I will never fully tell you about. It is an up-at-dawn, pride-swallowing siege that I will never fully tell you about. Holmes is going to guess. Jerry Maguire. Mm. A miss for Timon Wakafi. Okay. Let's see. Let's go back and find... All right, this is for Team James. I want you to take a moment, and I want you to look in each other in the eyes. I want you to put each other in your hearts forever, because forever is about to happen here in just a few minutes. I want you to close your eyes, and I want you to think about Booby Miles, oh. your brother. Oh. <laughs> they get it before I said Booby. All right, Friday Night Lights is it. You now only trail by two. <laughs> no, up, up five to four by my erroneous score. Let's go back. All right, Team Omo Coffee. Here we go. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, okay, here we go. All right, men, now here's the play we're going to use. I don't think they know this formation. It's called incidental punishment after the ball is blown dead. Any man you tackle gets an elbow, knee, or kick in the mouth. Longest yard it is, and we're back to being tied. Okay, you guys, this is the last inning. You can go up 6-5 to five or stay 5-5. to five. They're the home team and get the last bat. So if you miss and they get it, they win. If you get it, they miss, you win. If you both get it or both miss, we're going to end in a tie because we're running late. <laughs> okay, so here we go. Let's see. Uh, here it comes. Football is 80% mental and 40% physical. Football is 80% mental and 40% physical. We're, but since it's the possible winning point, we're not going to do this. Are you all going to have a different question? Little Giants, Little Giants is it. Was that going to be your guess? Yes. All right. So it's six to five. You need to get this one to pull into the tie. Here it comes. You ready? That may be the stupidest son of a bitch I've ever seen, but he sure is fast. Forrest Gump it is, and we end the tie. <laughs> <laughs> Oh wow! Man, you yeah. guys, you guys are good. I'm, I'm not kidding. We, <laughs> we've gone more innings than this with, with you know, other positions over the years, <laughs> and they hardly get a couple or three of them. And you guys got twelve all together between you. You guys know your football movies. That is really impressive. <laughs> all right. And now our final segment of the show: a preview of the Hutto Hippos. Uh, an interesting mascot, but I'd hate to be one, on one of the women's team, the Lady Hippos. Yeah, come on, they got to have something better for them than that. All right, <laughs> Cedar Park and Hutto have only played three times. Only one of those games was close. The first one played in the first season of Cedar Park varsity competition in 1999 A.D. at Hutto. It was a 17 to 14 Cedar Park win. It ended when our own Edder Holguin, the free safety, picked off a hippo pass with seconds left to preserve the win. The other two games were a 42-14 blowout in Hutto in 2016, and then last year a 38-25 win that wasn't nearly that close. It was 38-12 with four minutes left in the game. But this year's Hutto Hippos are the first team picked by Texas Football Magazine to win the district that Cedar Park plays in, besides Cedar Park itself, since 2010. They started out the season ranked number seven, while the Timberwolves start out number nine. An 0-2 start tumbled the T-Wolves out of the polls, but Hutto has hung on to that number seven ranking by being 6-0 overall, 2-0 in 11-5A play. As we mentioned earlier, their non-district slate was nothing remotely like the difficulty level of Cedar Parks, and yet they still had a two-point win and a one-point overtime win. In district play, they eased past Georgetown 38-14, not unlike what our game against the Eagles probably should have been. 
uh, if we haven't given up the two big touchdowns in the span of three plays in the middle of the game. But that's okay. Like I said, Hutto probably came away from that game not fired up to work as hard as Cedar Park. Uh, you know, Cedar Park had blown them out. Uh, the problem they present is terrific offense. Uh, of course, they've not yet even remotely seen any defense as tough as these guys, the Black Rain. But that goes both ways, though, as the Black Rain has not yet seen any offense remotely as good as Hutto's. They averaged 320 passing yards per game and 160 on the ground for a total average of 480. They have scored 36 offensive touchdowns this season. This is a serious offense. It's a serious team, easily the best team we will face in the regular season this fall. They're absolutely certain that they are going to beat us Friday night. They are in our way, standing between us and our seventh straight district championship. Here's Josh with the personnel rundown. Well, senior quarterback Chase Griffin, number 11, has been their starter for three years, and we've seen him before. Uh, most likely by the time the game is over Friday night, he will become the all-time leading opponent passer in Cedar Park history. Already, already in two seasons against us, he's 36 for 66 for 477 yards and four touchdowns with one interception, not like those blue chipper blues we're <laughs> doing those segments on. Uh, this equates to an NCAA pass rating of 136.22. Com by comparison, Ryder Hernandez's current rating is 153.02. Against everyone else this year, Griffin's 110 for 156, 1,600 passing yards and a 70% completion percentage rate with 25 touchdowns and two interceptions. He averages 14.4 yards per completion, and this equates to an incredible 207.36 NCAA pass rating, better than the collegiate record of 191 set by Russell Wilson in Wisconsin in 2011. He's playing well this year. A plus is that for Hutto is yet to really figure out how to run the ball against Cedar Park. In the last two years, they've only rushed 24 yards on 42 carries. That's a .57 yards per carry Love average. Love that. Love that. Now, their top running back, Chu Chuks Nwabuku. Nwabuku, number one, last season has 1,000 yards and just last week committed to Texas Tech. But against Cedar Park, he has ran eight times for one yard. There's a blue chipper, Blues. Now, this season he has 45 carries for 318 yards and a 7.1 average, but just one touchdown. Sophomore Kimball, number 22, has 25 carries for 175 yards, a seven-yard average with three touchdowns. And quarterback Griffin runs about three times per game for an average of 4.5. Uh, their top receivers are senior Caleb Forrest, number eight with 38 catches for 659 yards and 10 touchdowns. Wow. And senior Dejon Harrison, number three, has 26, carry, 26 catches for 383 yards, three touchdowns. And DJ Baptiste has 16 catches for 249 yards and six scores. Uh, defensively, some issues. They have given up a lot of yards and points. They give up a 40 points per game and a much easier slate and non-district opponents than Cedar Park played. Over the season to date, they've given up an average of 29.8 points per game. Uh, they only have about a third of the number of tackle for losses and sacks against the uh, as, versus the Black Rain. As the Black Rain. Correct. Does. Yeah. Against lesser offenses than we've played, Ryder and the Storm should be able to move well against them. Uh, this game may well turn into a shootout, and the video game numbers may happen. And Coach James, if you can come back and grab the mic here for a second, we'll talk to you a little bit about your defensive line and, and what it is that the Hutto's offensive line will try to get accomplished and what is it we need to do to defeat them? Uh, like we said before, we've got we've to establish the physicality up front. Uh, that's something we always talk and preach is, uh, you know, to be, to be violent. <laughs> there we go. I love it. It's a, it's a big, ding, ding, it's a big ding, ding, ding. part of what we do, but violent hands, quick off the ball. Um, you know, we always go into a game with the mentality that we've got to be able to beat five with three, um, and, and it takes a great effort to do that. You've got to study film. You've got to know your opponent. Um, but that's, that's our mentality going forward is that, you know, we've got to kind of put the, put the black rain on our back, and it starts with us up front. Use that depth, too, yeah. Yes, Keep sir. fresh bodies in there hitting people. If you give the mic to Holmes, we want to give Holmes a last chance to say something before we close down tonight. Holmes? On uh, what the? Could you ask that question again? <laughs> well, it, it wasn't a question. I just want to, you know, it's your last chance to to say something, anything on your mind, uh, whatever you want to say before we close out. Uh, well, as, I mean, going into this game, um, you know, as Coach said, I think, uh, you know, for the D line establishing that physicality on the line, and then being able to, you know, get in the heads of the uh, offensive linemen, specifically for you guys on the D line. I think you guys have a lot of influence on on, uh, you know, how their offense reacts and being able to, 
uh, establish establish uh, you know a you know a point there right off the bat. You know, really shows them that Cedar Park is there to play. But uh, in, in closing comments, uh, you know, it was a pleasure to be out here tonight. Uh, thank you guys uh, for having me. Thanks and, for uh, coming. Yeah, and uh, I'll be at the uh, the game on Friday. So Terrific. if you guys are around, uh, come say hi. All right. Now, one thing, uh, thanks, Holmes, and one thing about the game Friday night. Uh, Hutto has a small little stadium. It's primitive. Their press box is basically the equivalent of a, a, a one-by single side construction trailer hoisted up at the top of their stands with a couple of windows in it. And they've told us before, we had to do this a couple of years ago when we were there, there is no room for the uh, opponent broadcast team. We set up atop our own stands on the other side, outside, just at the very top of the stands. There's a flat place for us to put a chair, and there's a plug-in for our power cords. So the problem is 40% chance of rain, and we don't get to rain on the equipment. So there's a 40% chance we have to shut down the broadcast and, and won't get one. Friday night. We hope that's not true. And Holmes, that's where we are. You'll be on our side, the visitor's side. You'll see us up there. Come on up and talk with us. We'll put you on the broadcast with us for a little while and talk about this great D-line as they chew Hutto to death. All right, Josh, any last remarks before we go? I'm well, just excited. Uh, thank you guys to the defensive line for coming out. It, always good to see Holmes again. Uh, that's one of my brothers that I got to play with, so it's really cool just to have him back and uh, getting to pick your brain a little bit and getting to influence these younger guys that you continually do in our community, and we really do appreciate you coming back and doing that. Uh, but just excited for this game. This is what this whole season has been coming to right now, this game against Hutto. And so y'all have got to come set the tone. You've got to come ready to play for four quarters. Big plays are going to happen all night on both sides of the ball. It's just going to happen when two big teams get together. It's how you react, how you guys come together and bounce back from it. So it's going to be a crazy game. I hope that there's clear skies so we can get you the broadcast. All right, we'll be taking the bye next week, a reminder, along with the team. So our next episode here of TNI will be two weeks from tonight, 7.30 Central Time, live from across the street over there at Mouton's, the week of the Pflugerville game. And joining us that night will be key members of the special teams, kickers, punters, deep snappers, maybe you'll come back, uh, holders, return artists and such. So don't miss that one. We'd like to thank our guests tonight, Cedar Park Defensive Line. I'm going to miss some names here because some guys walked up after I wrote these down. Jacob Munoz, Ben Bell, Josiah Whittington, uh, Ben Blankenship, <laughs> Joshua Slowey, B.J. Jones, and with them, coaches Jason James and Samuel Four. Sorry for not getting the right names there. I forgot that I needed to put some in there. And, of course, Lifetime Timberwolf, Holmes Oma Coffee. This year's sponsors, Family Emergency Room, U.S. Money Reserve, Danny's Barbershop, Call Fire, Mouton's Majoris, Toyota Cedar Park, Jeff Dietz Allstate, The Grass Patch, Owlzer's Barbecue, Parker Electric, SRK Financial Group, Army Ant Moving, Bush's Chicken, Rudy's Barbecue, and the law office of Travis Williamson. My great thanks to my broadcast partner for Timberwolf Football these last seven years plus for all the work he does, Josh Willard. And our QA tonight, Les Clary. We'll see you live from Hutto Friday night on KMAX Sports Live worldwide broadcast of Game 8 of the 2018 campaign, Game 4 of the district race as the Timberwolves face off against the Hutto Hippos. Timberwolf Night in America presentation of KMAX Sports and the Vibe Network. Hutto. This is the KMAX Sports Network.